Good morning. Welcome to Ebenezer. Let's stand. Welcome home. thankful this morning. Let's give him our praise in this place. Amen. Stay standing with us. It's so good to see you this morning, and uh, we're super pumped that you decided to be here. And We know you could have been anywhere, and if you're watching online, thanks for, for joining us that way, and it's going to be an awesome day. First service was, was awesome. Jamie's got an incredible uh, message this morning, and, and uh, it's just a good day all around to stand and to be together, to worship a little bit. So we're going to continue to do that this morning. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who That's right, he will. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house. We won't be quiet, but we shout at your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is 
surely in this place We won't be quiet We shout out your praise We shout out your praise And we sing We sing to the God who heals We sing to the God who saves we sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung upon that cross and he rose up from that grave. And I got the rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Together we were, we were the bigger, and now we oh, praise God, sing it again. We were the bigger. And now we're royalty We were the prisoners And now we're running free We are forgiven, accepted Seen by His grace Let the house of the Lord sing praise Lord, you sing it out here, Lord There's joy in the together again in this place this morning. There's joy, amen. It's 
That's why I'm not a good golfer. Because I get up here and I'm going, okay, wait a minute. Do I have my notes out? Do I have my clock out? Do I have my Bible? Is my microphone on? I go through all these different things. And then I realize I'm still chewing on a cough drop. So if you heard it crunching through the microphone, I am so sorry. It's like, like I'm thinking about when I go to play golf. I'm going, all right, is my grip right? Is my stance right? Is my, am I in playing? And like, you know what? Preaching's not that complicated, is it? Amen. I take your Bible and I want you to turn to Acts chapter 14. Uh, we're, we're going to be talking about something today that, that really is a little bit sobering of a subject. But, but what I hope to do is, is let the Lord speak to our hearts and then let it instill joy and passion for what we're going to talk about today. And, and as, as I say often, I say again, I don't take for granted. I'm sitting in a room today and there's nowhere else I'd rather be than right here with you. If you're joining us online, I'm so thankful you're joining in with us, and I hope that you have the same affection this way, that there's no other place right now that you'd rather be than right here with other believers in the presence of the Lord, ready to hear what it is that He would want to speak to us today. And today we're going to be talking about persecution. And I know that's not something to go, oh right, man, I, I signed up today to go talk about persecution. But it is a reality that exists in our world, in our life. And today I want us to understand that we don't see the extreme of persecution. When was the last time you heard anyone use the term ISIS? You haven't heard it used in a while because the coalition claimed victory March 23rd, 2019 in Bagal, Syria as there was infighting in ISIS, this terroristic group that was just spread all over that part of the world wreaking havoc. But there's another date that I want you to recall, if you can, that happened on February 15th, 2015. Almost coming up on 10 years 
And for many of us, we were sitting there, maybe watching the news, or we heard it on the radio. But in, but in that time, there was this image, a video, and I, I hope nobody, don't even go home and try to look this video up. But a group, group of ISIS men dressed in black led out 21 Coptic Christians, 20 that were from Egypt, and one other that was from, from another African country, and they led them down to the beach dressed in orange, forcing them down into the sand, and took their lives. They beheaded them. And I, I, I can't, I mean, if you think about the way a knife works, this wasn't something like a guillotine from the French Revolution. Again, I, I don't want to watch this video, and I wouldn't want to encourage you to watch this video. But what it tells us today is that there are some pretty extreme acts of persecution that's happening in this world today. Now here in America, I mean, we experienced some similar types of, of persecution. In fact, back in a year ago, there was a man in the Mall of America in Minnesota that a security guard came to him and told him to leave because he had a t-shirt that said Jesus saves and it was offending people in the mall and he told the guy he had to leave. Now, let me balance that and say that he didn't leave. They let him stay, but still, the idea that he couldn't walk into a mall with a shirt that said Jesus saves. In fact, what was offensive was what was on the back of it that had the, the, the emblem coexist, but it said Jesus is the only way. And that was what was offensive, that people with the worldview that, well, it doesn't matter what religion you are, all, all come together. His was contrary to that, but to still say, no, you, you need to leave. Or maybe if you remember the name Jack Phillips, Jack Phillips is back in the news again. Back in 2018, he won a Supreme Court case for refusing to bake a cake for a gay wedding. Well, now another case, suitcase, has come against him individually that's going to the Colorado Supreme Court because he refused to bake a cake for someone who was having a party to celebrate their transitioning of genders. And then there was a third story that, that I read about, about a, a pastor in Ohio who was arrested, and get this, he was arrested for violating city ordinances for housing homeless people. I mean, for us today, I mean, many of us have experienced isolation sometimes for the faith that we claim. We, we may be, have been mocked for the faith that we cl claim, maybe overlooked or left out. Verbal harassment, or I hope not physical attacks, where I think that we see and read about future prophetic word is that what, what's going to happen to Christians is the weight of money. We're going to be persecuted by the means of money being taken from or being refused to trade because of our faith. And God help us that it would lead, lead to some extreme that we would have somebody in our lives that would die as a result of persecution. I've shared this story before, and I, I think it's fitting to share it again as I, as I read um, the book Jesus Freaks that DC Talk released many years ago. And the one story that has always stood out in my mind was, was this one in particular over in, in Asia where um, there was family that had been lined up. They had been arrested in the 50s. And there was a road paving crew there making the roads. But this, this group, the military had seized them and brought them out and, and had lined them up in front of a steamroller. And as the story unfolds that they were telling them to recant their faith and their kids are here with them as those parents are, are glorifying the Lord as that steamroller then begins to march over them. And that just happened 70 years ago. As I said, this is a very sobering thought today to even begin thinking about this idea of persecution. Why in the world would God allow His servants to die? Well, we read the biblical uh, text and we know from church history 
that all of the apostles died martyrs' death except one. That was John. But John suffered as well being boiled in oil. I mean, can you imagine what it looks like? I have a, a, a guy that I know that's my sister's age that we grew up together and he was caught up in a fire in a wreck and it burned like 70, 80% of his body. And I remember as a kid when he would come to church, he was a high schooler when this happened and there were scars that would, that would tentacle up his neck into his face. He couldn't grow facial hair because of the scars on his face. And you imagine John the apostle boiled in oil and then banished to a deserted island. It's biblical. In fact, when you read what John, Jesus said to the disciples in the upper room in John, in the book of John, he's in, in 16, 32, and 33, he says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you can have peace. I mean, Jesus told us that suffering to the extreme of persecution would happen, but he said, Take courage. I have overcome the world. And there's many reasons that we have trouble, but the primary reason that you and I have trouble in this world today is because of sin. I remember a football player being interviewed one time about racism. And he said something that the reporter didn't like. Because the reporter wanted him to say that because of certain things, that this is why racism, racism existed. But he went to the jugular. He said, it's sin. There's racism in the world because of Sin. There's suffering in the world because of sin. Some of that suffering is allowed on us because the Lord allows it to happen to us. We know that Paul talked about how he had a thorn in his flesh, whatever that was, that caused him discomfort and suffering. And as a result, though, God used it in his life to produce humility. We also know that sometimes God chastens us and it does not feel good. I don't know about you, but, but my parents punished me with a belt. And I don't think my dad would mind me telling this story, but my dad was a truck driver, and his nickname was Mouse. And um, my dad was six foot five at one time. And when I was 16 years old, could still one-arm me up off the ground. And on his belt was embroidered the word Mouse. There was nothing Mouse about that belt. It was not a timid little squeaky creature. The last spanking I got was December of my fourth grade year because I was smart enough to know I ain't getting that no more. But you know, God allows suffering in our life for the same reason, to chasten us, to redirect us, to put us on a path because he has a plan for your life. And when we deviate off that path, God loves you enough that he wants to redirect you. And we can have joy in our suffering because even the disciples considered it joy after they were whipped by the Sanhedrin. They walked out and said that it was a joy to be considered worthy to suffer for Christ. And then we see that Peter even wrote, check this out, Peter wrote, but if you do what is right and suffer for it, if you patiently endure it, this finds favor or grace with God. We find grace. In our suffering, that doesn't mean I go out there and say, all right, come on, somebody hit me. But in the process of us suffering for our faith, and let, me, let me clarify that, not for being a jerk. Don't be a jerk about your faith. There's a big difference. But being in the process of holding to your faith, the persecution that comes, God will give you grace for that. The grace that undergirds and holds us up and then we find ultimate victory and comfort and reward in the midst of persecution. Here's Paul writing to Timothy. And the name Timothy is going to come up a lot today. Just make a mental note. But he writes to Timothy words that you have heard before out of chapter 4, verse 7. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. And I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward me, and not only me, but all those who love his appearing. Do you know why we can say, I don't mind the aspect of suffering and persecution in my life? Because this is my mortal life, and the life that is to come is so much better than the life that I have now. When the disciples died martyrs' death, they didn't mind it. They didn't look forward to it. 
But they knew that they watched their Lord get out of a grave and come back to life, that the Lord could do the same thing for them. And in that, we can find that courage that Jesus talked about. Take courage. I have overcome the world. Why? Because he has overcome death. If we wait patiently and know the weight of our suffering, how it bears the mark of suffering for Christ, for sin, this world may can bring things against me, but we can count it all joy because the marks that we bear of persecution and resistance declares the suffering of the cross of Jesus Christ. When it's done for the cause of Christ. I think sometimes we get things mixed up just because something bad's happened to me. That, is, that must be something good. But sometimes things about, ha, bad are happening to you because you've done something bad. Can we just agree on that? I mean, don't, 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 make, don't make this some kind of karma that if I'm doing good stuff, I must be good. If good things are happening to me, I must be good. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. But sometimes good things happen to bad people. And sometimes bad things happen because we're stupid. I remember a pastor friend of mine telling me, he said, Faith is, if God tells you to go stand out in the middle of the road, he'll protect you. Idiocy is standing out in the road saying, All right, God, here I am. Protect me. That's a big difference. And what we're going to read today as we kind of walk back through um, chapter 13 and into 14 is how Paul and Barnabas... They had a lot of good things going in their ministry. And at the end of 13, it's kind of like they exit out. And I mean, the worst thing that had happened up to them at that point is some people resisted them and told them to leave. A lot of us have had that happen to us. They get to Paphos, and Elemus is standing against them. The spirit strikes him blind, and somebody gets saved. Man, that's a great story, isn't it? And then he gets to Antioch, and they go in, and they, they, they preach the gospel, and they're so hungry for it. They say, hey, come back next week, tell us some more. They show up next week, and they're standing there at the door saying, you need to leave. But what happened as a result? It said that the Gentiles believed, the word of God spread, and the disciples continued to grow, and all that's good stuff, right? But what we're going to read today, something different happens. So before, before we read, starting in verse 19, can I just kind of paraphrase, paraphrase what happens in 1 through 18? Just kind of follow along with me if you've got your Bible open. Because what happens now, they, they've left Antioch and they land in a city called Iconium, which is about probably about 85 or 90 miles away. So it's no short trip. It would take them days to get there. But just like they did in Antioch, they go in and they find the synagogue because that's people that have a like worldview. Their worldview was that God created, and you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the law, Israel, all that stuff. That's their worldview. So it's easier for them to go in to that context and say, hey, remember that promise about the, the king that was going to come through David? Well, I'm here to tell you who he is. But when you're starting from scratch with pagan Gentile people who don't know the Lord, he had to have a different starting point. Does he not? But what happens here? And we're going to see that in a few minutes with the story that we're going to tell. I kind of find part of the story comical today when he gets to Lystra. But right now, he's in Iconium. He preaches. Jews and Gentiles alike believe. But then there are Jews and Gentiles who don't like what's happening. In fact, they begin to talk about, in verse number 5, bringing bodily harm. But we know that they stayed there for a little while because, here's the, here's the truth, guys. The work of the gospel and evangelism, it sometimes takes time. I can't bake very well. I have two things I bake well. I, I like making lasagna, and I make, my, our staff team will agree, I make some good pecan pie. You heard Kevin Hurt say it. It's pretty good. But I can't make a pound cake to save my life. Well, that's the ones that rise, right? And if you stomp the floor, they... <laughs> never been able to make one. I just, I, I can't, I can't do it. And so, it takes time and patience if you're going to make disciples. Sometimes, it, like we talked about last week, you've got to keep going over and over and over and over. And then you begin to see the fruit that comes from the preaching of the gospel. Something takes root... Parents, how many, of, how many times has it happened, have you seen it happen where you sit there and you've read that Bible story to your kid night after night after night after night after night after night and you're like, man, I can't wait till they make that profession. 
And then they come to a Wednesday night program. You come to pick them up and they say, well, hey, your, your kid prayed to receive Jesus. And like, oh, man, I wanted to be there for that. That's why we encourage our parents. If you ever come to me and say, hey, I want you to talk to my kid uh, about whether or not they can be saved, I'm going to ask you, well, have you talked to them first? I want you to have that opportunity to lead your kid to faith before you come and get me to check off on something. And that's what they're doing. They're contending. But then that tension begins. And we see starting around verse 6, it says they became aware of it and they fled to other cities. And we have to know that anyone who sets out, I wouldn't, I'm not just going to say missionaries, but anyone who's going to go out and share the gospel needs to know there comes a point where you have to go, okay, wait a minute, I need to back up. I think we need to be sensitive to the people that we are sharing because if it becomes contentious, you start losing trust value. And when you lose trust value, the person you're trying so hard to contend with, especially if you become combative or if you become, um, start using words that, that are, are, are putting them down, they're going to shut off. You need to know and be sensitive about how far you need to go. And in this case, for your own good. And so they pick up and they go to Lystra. And as soon as they get there, there's a man who is lame in verse number 8. And Paul looks at him and tells him to stand up, and he began to walk. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Lystra. Lystra was supposedly uh, started as a colonial town of military people at the start of the, uh, the, the, the Roman Empire. And so they were a bunch of soldiers, and right outside the city was a temple to Zeus. Now, if you're going to build a temple... And you're going to pick one of the many, many gods that they worshipped. I mean, who better to pick than Zeus? I mean, he is the top dog, you're right. How many of you remember having to study mythology in high school or college or any, any other environment? But Joe, Joe, are you a master of, of, of Greek gods? I mean, he, his hand went up first. But you know that he was like, he was born from the Titan, Kronos. And, and so in his, in his paradigm... To explain natural phenomena, they created all these different idols and these different things to explain nature and experience. And they saw him as the God who oversaw all of humanity. And, he, and, he's, and he's depicted a lot of times as, a, as standing with a, a lightning bolt in his hand. As this providence that would work down. And so here's these soldiers in Lystra. And they were military, right? Well, they would sacrifice to Zeus, burnt offerings, when they had military conquest, when they had military victory. They would also sacrifice saying, hey, Zeus, give us blessing. We're about to go try to eradicate these people or take over this city. So this man gets healed. They're all standing here. This man probably was known because of where he was sitting. They knew. And he gets up and he starts walking. Now, who is the mouthpiece of Paul and Barnabas, in my notes I call them P and B, it's not peanut butter and jelly. But you got Paul and Barnabas and he's standing, who do you, who's the mouthpiece? Who's the one speaking? It's Paul. Now here's where, this is where it gets a little bit comical for a moment. What is their worldview? Their worldview is pagan. They don't know anything about Jehovah God. And so they look at this situation and go, whoa, this is Hermes. The son of Zeus, who is the mouthpiece, and he's speaking, and Barnabas is Zeus. They lose their mind. They go and start grabbing oxen out of the field, and they don't go to the temple because they believe Zeus and Hermes is there, and this mob ensues as they're bringing these animals because they want to kill him. Remember, they saw Zeus as someone who would bring conquest, and they're like, you know what? We've got the golden ticket right here. They were driven by their flesh. To show up. So here's P and B, Paul and Barnabas, and they rip their clothes saying, No, stop, stop it, stop, don't do this. You're, you're wrong, you're misunderstanding. So the mouthpiece, Paul, who had been telling them about Jesus, now he's being perceived as Hermes. They're not listening. The mob, the mob crowd had taken over at that moment and insisted, even against what it said. And that's the way we are in our life. We've got a lot of idols in our life. We kind of like to make Jesus in our own image. We like to make God in our own image. Or we make all these other things in our life idols to express us. The difference in Christianity is we're not trying to make God in our image. What we're trying to do is to become in the image 
of Christ. That's the plan of God for our lives. For us to die to sin, to walk in the spirit, to deny the flesh so we can be like him. The image that we're supposed to bear is of him, not the other way around. And the irony here is, is that the mouthpiece is speaking, but they wouldn't listen. How often is it in our life when we've made Jesus in our own image that we've stopped listening? I, that one needs to sit in the air for a moment. As we, we will sometimes, in our Christianity, stop listening to what God has to say. Got everything figured out. I don't, I don't need anything else. I mean, God's blessing me this way and that way. But is God calling you to something different? Is God calling you out of your comfort zone? We must strive to not let God become assimilated into our worldview. We must adopt His. In fact, Paul summarized this view in Romans 1, 19 and 20. When he's talking about the wrath of God coming against unrighteousness, he said, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they were without excuse. Well, what would be the excuse? Well, they've decided, no, I want to make a God in my own image. So I'm coming to you too because you guys seem to fit the bill and they're going to make sacrifices. But here's where it turns. Here's where it turns. Because what's going to happen is the Jews from the other two towns, they show up and mess up the party. In fact, this same mob that wants to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas now are ready to sacrifice them. The Jews are accusing them of blasphemy. And guess who else now is going to accuse them of blasphemy? The Gentiles. Even though they never claimed to be Zeus and, and Hermes, now they're coming against them. So I want to ask you to stand, and let's read 19 through 23 as this story uh, picks up. In fact, I'm going to read 18. He said, even saying these things, with difficulty they restrained the crowds from offering sacrifices to them. But it only takes a few words, and that crowd, just like Homer Kent said, disillusioned fanatics are easily led off into contradictory actions. They're going to sheath their swords they were going to use to sacrifice those animals and pick up other weapons to take them out. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul. The very thing they referenced earlier that they wanted to do, now they're doing it, and were dragging him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city, the next day he went away with Barnabas to Derbe. And after he had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, those are the two key points of mission work right there, to preach the gospel and to make disciples. Now this is beautiful. Don't miss these words. They returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, the very places that were, they ran him out of, that they tried to destroy him. He went right back to them. Y'all see that? How many of you would go back after somebody punched you in the face to the same place? Then it says in 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying, quote, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Let's pray. Father, as we dig into this text for the next few moments would you speak to us the work of the gospel is hard Lord no one in this room would ever say it's not but God it's so worth it and that's the value that we want to gain from this today that even in the midst of great persecution you were still glorified and your work still continued we love you Father in Jesus name Amen so you're going to follow along me in the study guide I have five things I want to share with you today I'd say five results of the work of the gospel that comes in us as we are working the gospel. And the four, first one is this. The work of the gospel is costly. I'm going to go ahead and get the negative one out of the way. The work of the gospel is costly. If you've ever been on a mission trip, what we would associate that with is, well, it cost me $2,000 to go on this mission trip. That is a cost, but that's not the cost I'm talking about. For many of us, it's the idea that that, you know what, if I identify myself with Jesus and I'm going to start living for him, it may cost me, my friends. It may cost me 
the love of my family. It may cost me monetarily. In fact, I remember a story I, I read many years ago of a, of a couple who was saved in Las Vegas. This pastor had been witnessing and, and they accepted Jesus, but the problem was is that their mode of work was to strip. That was their jobs. And through a process of time, they stopped doing that as employment. Why? Because they had met Jesus. And they didn't want their work to be out of alignment with what God was calling them to, which was a holy life. It costs something. But here's something else to understand. In that cost, I want you to know that there is someone playing in the background that is always seeking to rob you. Every tension, every conflict, every argument that you encounter on a daily basis always has some demonic presence about it. Satan's mission is to seek to steal, you all know this word, kill and destroy. And too often, you know, you'll find yourself in the emotion of the moment. Maybe you're arguing with your kid. Maybe you're arguing with your wife. But if you've ever pushed the pause button to say, you know what, this may be satanic. Now, I'm not saying that God, Satan has caused this to happen to you. I think one of the biggest pet, uh, pet peeves of mine is when somebody says, does something stupid, and they say, well, I had a devil on my back. Well, the devil didn't make you do it. He may have tempted you to do it, but you did it. You're responsible. But he's in the background, and he was in the background in this text. He, I believe, in some way, some spiritual way, was able to open up the hearts of these Gentiles or their minds in some way convincing them that the Jews that had come from those other cities saying, let's go knock them out. He convinced that mob that was wanting to sacrifice the Paul and Barnabas now to turn into the mob that would try to kill him. Let me remind you what 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4 says. And even if our gospel is veiled, covered up, diminished, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. There is always something satanic going on in the background. And when we recognize it, just like Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians, that we fight against things we cannot see, against principalities that we cannot see, then we understand where our target is. Let me, let me, let me say this. There's a verse that has just been burning in my brain and my heart lately. It's Ezekiel 33, 11. If you want to write that in your notes, please do so. Ezekiel 33, 11. You know what it says? God doesn't even want the wicked to die. Your enemy is not your enemy. Are you with me? Your enemy is not your enemy. Satan is the enemy. And the last thing we need to do is make a target out of that which is not. We, we may want to go after somebody because they've come after us. Well, that's your flesh. Paul, it doesn't say that Paul tried to run. It didn't say that anybody tried to, to step in and stop what was happening. What happened was he was stoned and he was left for dead. But now let's, let's turn it to the positive. Point number two, the work of the gospel is miraculous. We, we don't know if he died. Some theologians believe he died and God brought him back to death. I don't believe that because of Paul's own words. He said he was stoned, but I believe if he had been stoned by death, he would have said, God raised me back from the dead too. I don't think that happened. I think he was stoned to the point of death and was left for dead. They drug him out of the city. But whatever it was, it was miraculous. It was miraculous. And can I remind you of what the greatest miracle is? That person in your life, hard-hearted, lost, debaucherous, away from the Lord, living fully in sin and to see God get a hold of somebody like that and turn their life around what greater miracle is there what greater miracle is there and you know what that was the miracle that Paul was after the Bible says here that he got up and he went back into the city he went back into the city that just stoned him oh my what would you do if you had gotten in a fight at some place would you ever go back into that place no one, because you're probably afraid you'd run back into that person again. That's fear. Paul had no fear. But here's the other thing that we've seen here. It says that there were disciples standing around. Paul just showed up that day. Who are these disciples? 
What we see here is that Paul isn't the only means that the gospel was going out into the world. There were already some established disciples in that city, and one of them most likely was a young man by the name of Timothy. Because when we get to missionary two in a few months, missionary trip number two, he goes back through Lystra and he picks up a young man named Timothy who had a good reputation. And Timothy kind of becomes his protege. And he takes him under his wing. That's one of the reasons why he's, we have two of the letters that he recorded to Timothy. Because they were so powerful. Paul is simply a walking miracle. Now I want you to imagine that scene for a moment. Here's Paul. And he is laying lifeless. Every square inch of his body has some kind of a mark on it. It may be a cut. It may be a, an open wound. He's covered with blood. He's left for dead. And the disciples, I mean, they're going like, they're all shocked at how quickly things went south. This wasn't what happened in Paphos. This wasn't what happened in Antioch. They're standing there. And they are absolutely shocked, standing around Paul as his lifeless body is laying there. But all of a sudden, they see a twitch. And they see him moving. And I don't know, maybe, maybe with, just, with, the, with the sounds of grunt, he, he slowly gets up. His body is bruised and battered. Again, it said to the point of death. And, may, and maybe they just all kind of go, Whoa, this is, this is wild. And then Paul, I don't know, maybe, maybe, his, maybe he just pulls his robe back up on his shoulder. And maybe, maybe he's dragging his leg, but he slowly makes his way right back into the lion's den. You know why? Point number three, because the gospel is courageous. It's courageous, ladies and gentlemen. There is something unsatisfying about not doing the gospel, but there's something very satisfying about continuing in the work. He got up and he went in the city and the next day it said that he left there and he went to a place called Derby. And if you look on a map where Lystra is and where Derby is, about the same distance between those two is this place called Tarsus, which is where Paul was from. He's halfway home. You know what Paul could have done? He could have skipped through Derby and went on home. But he says he went into Derby and he preached. Preached. I wonder how well he was at this point. I wonder if, I wonder if they actually had to come and put, him, put a stone for him to sit on because I, I bet he broke some bones too. And here's this man at the minimum who's covered with scars, possibly covered with scabs. And they're looking at him like, who is this freak? And it says that he evangelized and he made disciples. Why? Because he was courageous. When you and I step into the will of God and the Spirit of God has got us where He wants us to be and we understand and, and realize and seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit of power, there is nothing that will stop you from going again and again and again to proclaim. No matter what is hurled at you, whether it be words or rocks, you will keep going back again and again and again. The only other place where this verb is used to make disciples is in the Great Commission at the end of chapter 28 of Matthew. Where he said, go therefore, and what? Make disciples. And you know why that's important? God didn't just save you for you. God saved you to take these small little steps of faith. To take these little, little bitty leaps, so to speak. So that you can make a difference in this life. In fact, this quote, I love this quote. Let me, let me start right here says this, Luke mentions the fundamental activity of missionary work, which is to proclaim the gospel. But he also relates the fundamental goal of missionary work, which is to win disciples. You see, it takes time to leave an impact. Sure, I mean, we see where Paul went into some cities, preached the gospel, some people got saved, but there were other people that came around that and started to kind of nurture that faith. 
And they began to see that, great, that faith begin to take root and to grow. Why? Because number four, the work of the gospel must be penetrating. I said is, and it is penetrating, but it must be penetrating. They did this because, verse 22, it's strength to strengthen the souls of the disciples. Well, why do they need to be strengthened? Paul shows up in Lystra. He's preaching the gospel. Man gets healed. He gets stoned. He gets drug out of the city. He stays the night, goes to Derby. Those people who heard the gospel that day, that accepted the gospel, they're standing there going, what do I do now? Too often in the church, that's exactly what we do to people. We drag them down to an altar, scale, scare hell into them, tell them how to be saved, and then we just let them be. But folks, the work of the disciple is to make a disciple. And it must penetrate within me deep, not on the outside, but it must go deep to my soul. And he encouraged them to continue in the faith. And why in the world would they listen to Paul? Because by this point, Paul's shown up like in Lystra, He's not bleeding anymore, but I can tell you what, he was a scarred man. And you know what? Those people would probably have been like, I wouldn't go back into that city either. Wash my hands of them and keep on going about my business. Look what they did to me. You know what that's called? That's called unforgiveness. And it takes an act of God to be able to bring forgiveness into my soul such that I, just like it says in Ezekiel 33, do not want to see my enemy die. What would it look like if we were so strengthened in our spirit that if somebody was going to go to hell, they'd have to go over my dead body? Do I believe in the gospel enough that I'm willing to go to the same cross that Jesus went? Not so, I can't pay for anyone's sin, but I'd be willing to lay it all on the line so that they'd be in heaven. That's hard, isn't it? But it's true. It's deeply true that... Because we have this courage that's inside of us. Because we're being strengthened on the inside. Paul is now a living testimony. The scars on the outside reveal the great fortitude that's been forged on the inside. I love what Tony Evans said. He said, although not all believers will experience the same kind of problems or the same level of persecution. Quote, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's according to 2 Timothy 3.12. He said, so we, we need the encouragement of a community of disciples to help us continue in the faith and to spiritually grow as kingdom disciples. What is that saying? Guys, you need church. You need church. You don't just need to attend. You need to be engaged in church. Because that's what strengthens the soul. That's what encourages you to continue in the faith. When I'm absent or disconnected, I'm like the weak caribou that the wolf peels off the pack and consumes. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. That was their mantra. What do we say around here is our mission statement? To lead the broken to hope in Christ. That, that's very, very positive, isn't it? But listen to what theirs was. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Tribulations is not the door. In other words, just because you suffer doesn't mean you're going to get to heaven. That's the path. But the door is Jesus Christ. He's the door of the sheep. And he died so that he could open the gate for us to go into. And because of that, the call for you and me isn't just to believe. It's to replicate. The work of the gospel is replicating. As they were doing the work of evangelism, they were establishing churches, outposts, to keep the work going. It's about a faith legacy that I want to leave an impact on other people as I go. And so what did they do? And I mean, we could preach this, this verse and unpack church leadership and all the other things. But notice what they did and why they did it. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom... They had believed. I don't know who they selected. I don't know what, I, I kinda, we kind of know from later letters what they were looking for. They were not looking for novices. They were looking for people who were grounded in their faith, who had knowledge of the scripture that could continue the work. And that word appointed literally means to lift hand is what it's saying. They laid hands on them 
fasted and prayed. Does that not sound a lot like what happened at the beginning of Acts when they were sent out? They laid hands on them and they sent them. And in laying their hands on them, they were commending them back to the Lord, saying, God, these are your men. You're responsible for them and they are responsible to you. What? To replicate the faith. To keep it going. Folks, as a disciple, don't stop learning. You know how idols are made in your life when you forget this. And idols in America don't look like idols around the world. Idols in our life may be our work. Idols in our life may be travel ball. Idols in our life could be a a host of different things. But, But when they become more important, it actually becomes the image of me and my desires and my wants rather than me falling in line with a holy God who loves me, wants to give me life, but only in Him can I experience that life. These leaders were commended in the Lord to continue the work. And so for us today, I want us to remember this one thing, that we need to trust in God in persecution. It's going to happen. I don't want to be one of these guys saying, hey, it's coming, it's coming, because I don't know if it's coming or not. But we can see in America there is slowly, slowly a shifting away. I don't want it to become combative, and neither do you. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, not signing up to be beaten, okay? I don't want to do that. But if that day comes, will you stay faithful? I mean, honestly, today, if you want to measure the faith that you have in Jesus Christ, ask yourself the question, if that kind of persecution happens in my life, am I going to stay committed? Or will I run? Paul didn't run. Paul went right back to the same places that had persecuted him. And in that, that perseverance perseverance produces something great. I want you to watch this video. And this video is put out by Voice of the Martyrs. And I chose this video for a certain reason because the lady you're going to see in this video, she is from Pakistan. And I want you to hear her story about what happened to her. But more than that, I want you to see what, she, what conclusion she comes to as a result of her faith. So watch this video for a moment. Thank you. 
I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants and brothers and sisters were killed just as they had been. Tin Boone that later after um, the camps that she was subjected to in World War II in Germany came face to face with one of her guards and much like this lady in this video had to make a decision at that moment for the cause of the gospel will I forgive and she did today I want to invite you that as we close this message and close our service in just a minute, Kevin's going to come and dismiss us after I pray. I want to challenge you to a couple of things. Number one is I want to encourage you to continue thinking about the idea that around this world today, there are people dying for their faith. I don't know how many that's going to be this year. Last year, 5,000 people died for the cause of Christ. How can you and I be an encouragement? Well, one one thing that you can do is go to vo the Voice of the Martyrs. It's persecution.com is their website. And you can sign up for their updates. You can sign up for their magazines. But I can tell you, you won't see that story on the headline news. Because to the world, that story has no significance. But for us, it has eternal significance. Maybe you go to IMB, you can go to NAM, and you can sign up for, why? So that you can be in the know. And maybe through that, you can ask yourself your question, your household, how could I be engaged with one missionary? When we talk to missionaries and we talk about coming to be with them and what we could do for them, you know what they say more than anything? I just need encouragement. And your presence is encouraging. What would it look like if your family decided to sign up for, no, I mean, maybe on a Samaritan's Purse and that you're doing a shoebox or Compassion International, you're sponsoring a kid, or, or maybe you decide that one of our mission partners, you decide, hey, you know, once a month, I'm going to send them a letter or an email. That's something very practical you can do. Why? Because they're on the front lines. And we're not. Our front lines is the city of Tekoa. And right now, it seems pretty safe. But what are we going to do the day when it's not anymore? And then lastly, I, and this is, I want to end on a happy note and I'm going to pray. Thank you. We changed our mission giving to give to go back two months ago. And if you see in your bulletin, we, you have given over $10,000 already to give to go. Well, why did we change the name of it? Because remember, 25 cents of every dollar goes to IMB, to Lottie Moon. Annie Armstrong is the other 25 cents. And then 50 cents on the dollar goes to send someone on mission that means you've already raised five thousand dollars to help people go on mission this year twenty five hundred for each of annie and lottie and guys i just want to say thank you thank you for your generosity thank you for your willingness to give because we don't know every little seed that's sown we don't know what will happen and since we've raised ten thousand four hundred dollars i say that's a big ten four you guys rock Father, as we close this service today, I ask that you would speak to us as we consider, Lord, what can I do to be an encouragement to somebody who's on the front line, who is in harm's way, who is in danger, and that, God, that you would help us to be mindful that even as we sit here right at this very second, there are those hiding that are having to be elusive from, from, from the cops so that they could even meet just to gather together as believers. And we have a great freedom here so in our freedom, let us not take it for granted and let us be an encouragement around the world that we would have a part in sharing the gospel. We love you, Father, in Jesus' name. And everybody said. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together, church, as we dismiss. Let me tell you a few things. One, isn't it encouraging even to hear a message on persecution and suffering that we are reminded that we will not give up or shut up until we're taken up, right? And that's exactly what we hear in the stories of Scripture today and in that 
video we watched today. And I want you to be encouraged by that because, you know, you can't stop what God is doing, and that is building his church. It's been said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. You kill them, they keep growing. You try to stop them, they keep going. And I hope that goes on for us today. And we will not only pray for those missionaries, but for one another because we need the encouragement to keep on going on, whether it's being mocked or made fun of or just losing opportunities because you're a believer. We need that encouragement. And speaking of believers, I want you to pay attention to a couple of things. One, these new members, we want to celebrate that God is adding to our church. We have Lou Carlson, Brandon, Megan, Leah, and Lincoln Fowler, and Stephen Jarvis. Could we give it up for those new members and say, thank you. So glad you're a part of what God is doing here. And speaking of membership here, I hope if you've been coming to Ebenezer and you've just never made that step into membership, can I invite you to come on March 24th to our next Discover? It's just what it's about, discovering who we are and what we are committed to and what we're doing here in this church. Coming to Discover doesn't mean you have to become a member, but it is the first step in membership here. And we would love for you to sign up on the app and do that. Finally, I want to just encourage you, as we prepare for the summer at VBS, we still need volunteers to sign up. Just go to the church app, sign up there. So good to be with you today. Loved our time together. Pray you'll fellowship and hang a little bit with each other today. If you are a visitor, if you'll stop by the Connection Center on the way or the welcome table on the way out, there's a little gift for you and just our way of saying thanks for being here. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have an awesome day today.